Oh, hi. <laughs> right, so hi, Andrea. Andrea. Okay, let, let me start. Right, this is Penelope. Everyone say hello to Penelope. Hello, hi. Penelope. Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah. hello. <laughs> She's not coming again. And, and obviously the woman down in the bottom has been with us a while, Pam. The one with the sexy voice. Say hello, Pam. Hello, Penny. Hey. Hello, Pam. Hello, Pam. Um, Pam. What do you think of everyone? <laughs> You're all lovely. A, a so desperate nice brunch. <laughs> a desperate brunch. You're making me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it don't make me laugh at all. Um, right. Um, I, 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 right. I would like to. We, um, this this week, if you if you um, if you look at your screen, we're gonna we're gonna just do a bit of um, extra stuff today. We're gonna if. If, um, there you go, you see the little hand on the screen there? Ah. Yeah. In, in, in reactions, right, when you want to react yeah. to something, you can put your thumb up in the air, say you want to ask something. Like Penelope's just done something. Penelope, we haven't started yet, you know. So. Right, so if you want to put, <laughs> put a reaction thing in, that's good. Just, just, a, just a few announcements before we start. Um, um, uh, Vale Glamour, uh, oh, Voluntary Glamorgan, I can't even say it. Glamorgan Voluntary Services. Um, we had a donation. We had a grant at the beginning of the week of two hundred pounds, and that's uh, paid mm -hmm. now for uh, three tablets um, that will find their ways going to Terry, Kathy, um, Alan, um, and Dennis, um, and also Sandra and Barry, and a couple of people in Bridgend. So these classes are being recorded, um, and this recording will be viewed by Kathy. And Kathy will be making comments as of next week. <laughs> so, oh, we're, so we're not allowed to refer to Kathy as being a, a damnable old witch. Um, oh. We can't say that she should be burnt at the pyre. Um, and she, sh she should, you can't say terrible things like that. Oh, I forgot it's being recorded, isn't it? Honestly. There's nothing else we can say about her. Then. <laughs> There's nothing nice that we can say about her, is there? Um, oh. So, so the other thing that we're planning, uh, this is dependent on the Vale of Morgan Council. It'll be me and Rosamond going out to places like East Orchard Castle um, and Tinkered with Burial Chamber, and we'll be preparing um, uh, um, DVD uh, discs um, if we can get the technology. And, and everyone will be having a disc if they so wish of different places that we have visited. Um, and um, and obviously um, you, you'll be welcome to receive them if we manage to get that done. Oh, go oh. on, go on. Yes, yes, go. Off. Don't practice social distancing. What's that? Don't you practice social distancing? Um, well, been going for a walk. Uh, um, te technically, a person working for Archaeology can refilm in me. Um, that is not covered under the, not, uh, the um, social distancing um, legislation. Um, so there you go. Oh, yeah. Oh. No, no the cobras. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in an office, Scott. So uh, you have to stand six feet apart. Yes. <laughs> With a mask yeah. and gloves. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And did you notice that meeting before the shutdown, every, everyone was issued with face masks if they wanted one and a pair of rubber gloves. And um, Gillian still got her rubber gloves and she cherishes I them. I have. Ooh. <laughs> Putting them to good use, I'm sure. Um, right. Um, I, so I would um, like to, I'd like to mention that... Um, um, Jim, in the near future, you and I are going to be doing some photographs down at Pavilion Cave. Um, and um, so, Jim, I want a word with you about that um, at the end. And next week, we'll be doing a completely different series of lectures. Um, and that uh, completely different series of lectures will be um, to look at archaeology of major events in history. So we'll be doing the Teutonburg um, forest uh, archaeology next week where we see the annihilation of three Roman legions. So anyone who doesn't like the Romans will have their vengeance next week. <laughs> lots of Romans beheaded, lots of armour, um, lots of all sorts of things that go bump in the night. So were we clear about that? Right. Um, so... Check, check, the time, check the tide tables first because I can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that'll be an adults-only class then. 
<laughs> right, so has anyone got anything to say before we start today? And I know before Goff says it, get on with it, right? Um, I've, I've heard that. So anyone else want to say anything else before we start? No, 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 no. Get on no. with it. <laughs> okay. do, do, do you know what? You, you, you've got a really good sense of humour, right? So, um, so I need two people to um, keep me company on the um, for the next um, forty-five minutes. So, who is that to be? Um, any? So, put your little, get your um, little reactions up. I need two people to join me. Mics to remain on. How do we get reactions up? Yeah. There's reactions at the bottom of the screen. There you if go. If you scroll over the screen, no, 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 oh, no, at the bottom, oh, where Penelope. it says Keith, not Keith. on my participants chat. Yeah. No, I'm on reactions. Nice, I, I oh, haven't fun. got that. Yeah. Oh, I haven't got. All right then, Keith. You're one of my. You're one of my minions, yes. and Karen can be one of my minions. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to cut all your mics now. Um, I'm going to mute you all. Get on with it. Uh, oh, and, uh, and, I, and I get it. Also, nobody can unmute themselves themselves. Um, so, Keith, um, what I need is for um, Keith to join me. So, unmute Keith. Can you hear me, Keith? I can hear you, Daddy. Oh, this is really worrying. Um, and can you hear me, Mother? I can hear you, Sen. <laughs> It, I have just worked something out there. Therefore, you and Keith have had relations. <laughs> no, no, no. Keith called you daddy. So Keith would be my son as well. Yeah, she's my grandmother. <laughs> oh my god. This, this is. Oh yeah, me. grandson. Sorry, you're right. <laughs> Hi, grandson. You doing okay? <laughs> Right. Okay. okay. I, I, what we're going to do? We're going to get started. So, um, all, all I all I need to know now is um, what can you see on your screen, Keith? Nothing. Two pots, or a pot and an half. <laughs> um, yeah. What What can you see, Karen? Yes. Picture of two pots, full one and a broken one, and then the people down the side. There's nothing wrong with being down the side. I've been down the side <laughs> all my life. Um, right, so um, this, is, this is a rather difficult one to put across today. I've, I've, we did it on Monday with our only live class still, social distancing on Monday golf. Um, mm. you, see, you see, we do wear face masks with our remaining class that I still teach. Um, and we looked at this on Monday and the big decision made on Monday with the lecture was that I was to focus on the archaeological excavations at Cleese Rosser on Anglesey um, in connection with um, Llewellyn um, the Great, um, who died in 1240, and Llewellyn the Last, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, who died um, on the 11th of December at 12 o'clock in the year um, 1282. And in fact, for once, 12 o'clock is not a date, a time that I've made up. Um, so mm. I, I thought that we'd concentrate on Cleese Rosser, but I, it was also um, looking at Gwentlian, um, the princess um, that died at the Battle of um, Mice Gwentlian. Um, and it, I, when, when I looked at uh, Gwentlian, there just wasn't enough evidence um, involving her at the battle to actually look at. But I decided to put enough into it that we could have a 20 minute bout looking at that information. Um, one, one thing that I've really struggled with looking at the excavations at Cleese Rosser is, look, is finding actual artifacts for it. Um, I've got a, a wonderful site plan, I've got some nice photographs, but I haven't got any artifacts. So I've had to drag in artifacts from other locations. So the, the, the pottery that you can see in front of you is um, probably circa um, uh, 1250, 1300. So it's about the time that Cleese Rosser um, was uh, being used. Um, and this type of archaeological evidence comes from the medieval village um, of Cosmeston. Um, that I'm happy to say that I was involved with the excavations there, um, and I and I got to know the I got to know the artifacts very well at Cosmeston because I spent two years washing it. Um, mm. That's all. That's all they can get um, um, an eight-year-old to do at that stage. But that's life. 
Um, how, however, um, one of the one of the things um, to actually paint the scene is to actually get get a grip on what the artifacts look like. So the, these are typical sort of cooking pots, storage pots from that period. Uh, and um, when you're trying to research these types of topics, it's really useful to have publications. And um, um, we've got a big library in Barry that I um, I can't get to at this minute. And I could have shown you more images of artifacts, but nevertheless, I've got one or two to show you today. Um, and as this talk is, is very much about um, um, the princes and, and a princess of Cumbry, Wales, um, we, we can't be without images of um, that aristocratic um, stock. This is actually a seal um, of Llewellyn ap Eurath, Llewellyn the Great, who died in 1240. Um, so to give you an idea that we did have princes and that princes did exist, here is the prince's seal in front of you. Um, and that is more than archaeological evidence. That's a, that's a true factor to illustrate the historical evidence, but more in the physical uh, and the practical sense in the archaeology. Very much it used to be said, and I actually have a quote in a publication that I've got in front of me that's um, regarding Wales. Um, and, and this quote regarding Wales, which um, I, I will do so um, after the break, points to the fact that we have so little archaeological evidence in Wales um, that trying to understand our past in Wales is fraught with a great deal of difficulty because people have concentrated on the Roman archaeology, um, the industrial archaeology, the Iron Age archaeology in Wales, but they haven't concentrated on the archaeology of Wales before the Normans or before the Normans um, had conquered the whole of Wales by 1283. And a point that I made last night as well is that um, up until about um, 10 years ago, if you ask me um, where's the evidence of people being buried in the Iron Age anywhere in Britain, I would say that we've hardly got any evidence of people being buried in the Iron Age. So archaeologists used to say um, that people in the Iron Age used to put their loved ones in the water and that's why we don't find the evidence. And lo and behold, in 12, um, 2017, um, an archaeologist from Cardiff University starts, starts to look at Iron Age sites and lo and behold, what does he find? People being buried in the Iron Age. So even though there's an absence of archaeology, it doesn't mean to say that that archaeology isn't to be found one day. And another key point I made last night, if you ask me how many princes of, of Cymru, Wales, produced coins um, three or four years ago, I would say one. And last night I demonstrated that there were at least four Welsh princes actually produced coinage. Um, and, you know, these things change. And Cleese Rosser is a wonderful site that up until um, 1992, we had no evidence in the archaeology of the Welsh princes ever existing. In 1992, they found the palace site of Llewellyn ap Yorath and Llewellyn the Last at Cleese Rosser um, at Aberthrow on Anglesey. So this is about rediscovering our past in, in lots of ways. That shouldn't be there. <laughs> Nobody saw that image then. Um, so you did, I know you did, Keith. Very naughty man. Um, now, we've got an aerial view of Cleese Rosser before we actually look at Gwen Uh And this is an aerial view of um, a landscape um, that we think, think didn't exist. But people um, had an idea that something may have been here for many generations. The field was known as Kaya Hlis, um, Kaya Hlis. Um, and being a site known as Kaya Hlis, um, Hlis meaning palace or place of a prince or a king, but nobody ever thought that this was actually the palace of the Llewellyn the Great himself. They just ignored the evidence. Um, and that there is a very large church as well. And the scale, to give you an idea of scale, um, that is, um, that is a, a car on the road there. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the palace building and in association with the church as well. It's a church in the middle of nowhere today, completely in the middle mm. of nowhere. 
Um, and the, the nearest um, town is a place called Newborough. Um, and it's called Newborough uh, because it's a new town established by the Normans under the command of Edward I. So this is after 1282, 1283. Basically, Edward I said, right, people, you are now subjects of the English crown. You have always been subjects of the English crown since 1066. I don't care if you had a leader referred to as Llewellyn the Great or Llewellyn the Last, Llewellyn ap Gruffydd, and so on and so on. I have always been your leader. You are now to move to Newborough, and you are to, be a, you are to abandon uh, the, the, the place of the royal kings of Aberfrau, the royal leaders of Aberfrau. Uh, and within about 20 to 30 years, the, the site was overcome by sand and was lost forever, except the church survived. Um, and one thing about place names is rather interesting. Um, um, none of you remember the first class that I had in Lantwit Major. And the first class I had in Lantwit Major, I had Kathy in the room all alone. Um, and me and Kathy, we started looking at maps. And I said, what can you see about that map? And it was place names. You know, um, uh, fields referring to Arthur and fields referring to Caradog and fields referring to this monastery and that monastery and this Norman and, um, and that Welsh prince and all the rest of it. Um, and the evidence sometimes is actually on maps. You might not actually find the archaeology, the, 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 the bones or, or the stone and so on and so on. But place names are really important. Um, except sometimes when you get place names associated with battles, as we're going to come on to, unfortunately, very little survives in connection with battles. Um, and the big difference between an archaeological site like this, and if any of you have ever been to Trelec with me, where you've got a, a, a Norman city, uh, and you've got this site, you've got lots of walls and artefacts, and people have lived there over a very, very long time. All those different pages of the book that you open. But with a battlefield, uh, you have um, a little bit of paper that flutters in the wind, and if you, if you don't see where that little bit of paper goes, you can't find the archaeological evidence for the battle. Um, so, this is where we are now. And, um, and I, I don't know what you can see at this minute, but you can obviously see a castle behind castle. me. Castle, yeah. Castle. Yes. Nice big castle. And you can see a nice <clears throat> big castle here. Now, scratch and sniff. Do you know, I, I've totally forgotten who else has joined us. Um, who's got their mic on? Um, who is it, Keith? Sharon. Me. Karen. Karen. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, mother, the mother of Keith or something. Two Ks. Your mother, Keith's grandmother. Oh, God. <laughs> the two Ks, yeah. Do, do, you know, do, you know what? do you know what? In the afternoon, right, I've, I've got two women called Anne in the class. Um, and Goff knows Anne. And, um, and the other Anne isn't as dippy as the other one. So when I say, come on, Dippy, tell us something, the other one takes it to heart. So don't say that we've got two Ks, okay? This is Deneville <laughs> Castle. Um, this is Deneville Castle. And this, this is a castle that um, could be associated with um, um, being um, part of the family of, of sites within the kingdom of Highbath, um, associated with the Welsh princes. But the real part of this history comes into the Normans, De Neville Castle. Um, very much the castle that you see in front of us is, is Norman build. It's a bastardization of everything that is Norman within the landscape. And this comes into the field of play and information when we look at Gwentlian. Princess Gwentlian. There are two princesses, Gwentlian. There is, there is Princess Gwentlian, uh, the daughter, the only surviving child of Llewellyn the last, um, who was taken away um, from her mother after the death of the last Prince of Wales, um, was put in a nunnery, and she never ever knew she was um, a true princess of Wales. Um, and, but the other Gwentlian lived in the 1100s. 1135, 1136 is the date that we're looking at today, quite, um, quite firmly, and quite firmly within this landscape. And where is this woman? Um, this is Gwentlian, um, a warrior princess. Now, many of the famous figures that we've been looking at recently have undoubtedly been men. But we did look at Boudicca, and we did look at Gwentlian, we did look at a Swedish um, warrior, uh, we did look at a number of other women in our lectures. So women have a firm role in history. 
um, they they have they have a they have a, a role to play that is usually outside the box. So when you look at Joan of Arc um, being burnt at the stake in 1431 on the 31st of, of May, um, she is a, a warrior woman. Gwendolyn is a warrior woman as well. Her husband went up, up north to gather support against the Normans, um, um, and Gwendolyn was the was the person who was to stand off a Norman army. A Norman army um, that could be associated with this king, Henry II. Um, and then, when we look again, this is where we see Kidwelly Castle. Um, obviously, there's much to be said um, about the landscape that we're looking at. In the, in between, um, 1135 and 1136, um, and anyone that knows anything about the period, um, good King Henry dies. He's been on the throne for 35 years. And albeit, Henry um, is sort of got a Lizzie Fair um, relationship um, with the people of this kingdom. And I do believe that somebody has just joined us. So I've got to stop screen sharing. Let's bring in Sue. And we can heckle Sue as she comes in for being late. Right, good. We could put our thumbs down. I, I, I tell you what, that, I tell you what that Sue, you know, she chooses a time when to, when to join our lectures very late. Um, I'm going to mark her down as being late in the book. So back to this, Kidwelly Castle. There it is. There's the location. It's sort of in the, it's not in the thickest of West Wales. It's in the territory of De Haibath, um, which is the um, old princely kingdom of, of, of the West Wales um, uh, princes. And Cardigan is important to us today. Kidwelly is important. And Lucha is important as well. And the reason why, at Cardigan, an English army was annihilated. Um, it's likely that um, a loss of life of about 5,000 um, English um, soldiers and Norman soldiers, um, many of uh, their wives and children massacred at Cardigan in revenge for the events that transpired at Kidwelly a few months earlier, uh, the massacre of, of Gwentlian's army at the hands of the Normans. And also, just before that as well, we see probably around the same time as Kidwelly, we see another battle at Lucha, where another 500 Normans that are thankfully massacred um, by the um, Welsh lords of the Gower and Glamorgan. Um, and in revenge for that massacre at Lucha, um, Kidwelly sets the scene. So, um, what we have is um, a map um, um, as um, provided by us by the Royal Commission on Ancient Historical Monuments. And this, um, this um, location of the battlefield, that little dot, um, if you look at local, local maps, says Mice Gwentlian, the field of Gwentlian. And it was named Mice Gwentlian um, around 100 years later. The Battle of, um, the battle of um, um, Gwentlian uh, was recorded by um, um, Geraldus Cambrensis. And anyone who knows anything about Geraldus Cambrensis, and this is a thumbs up for Cathy, who will be um, watching this video, um, she will remember that um, at the National Museum of Wales um, in 1988, we celebrated Geraldus Cambrensis, Gerald de Barry, um, um, uh, Gerald of Wales, um, who had a tour around um, um, the Principality with Bishop Baldwin, um, and he recorded in 1191 the events of the battle. Um, and that's the only, uh, that's the only um, um, reference that we have um, in writing of the battle. So archaeologists have been very keen to go to the site of Mice Gwentlian to find some archaeological evidence. Um, and this itself um, is the um, Royal Commission on Ancient Historical Monuments um, entry um, on their website. Uh, in connection with this battle. It is rather interesting. Um, and to be honest with you, I haven't got much else to add to it, except the docu document, which I will scroll down 
um, to give you an idea of the amount of waffle I've got to read through to prepare these lectures every week. But this is actually quite um, succinct. And the one thing that is very, very difficult is, is the interest in battles within Cymru, within Wales. And what I mean by that is there are so many um, black holes in connection with Wales. I've given a few. Um, and black holes is battles. Uh, we know where the battle of um, um, Porch um, Melin was. We know where the battle of Killeth was, two great battles associated with Owen Glyndor uh, and the battle of Cowbridge. We know where the battle of St. Fagans was. Um, we know where the battle of um, Cardigan was. Uh, but many of the battles, we don't really know where they were because nobody's really been interested up until the last two or three decades. So the Royal Commission is really having to get out there, get more information because they've been understudied. If, if, you're, if you're over the border and for Pete's sake, somebody else has just joined us um, and Jane as well. Sue and Jane, very naughty people for joining us so late today. Hello, Jane. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I've, I've, I've lost my file a minute. There we go, uh, Jane. What are you seeing now? Um, I'm not going to add anybody else if they lose us today. Um, what are you seeing at Onion. this moment? It's a, a text. Good. Site description. Good. Thank you very much. So looking, looking at the site description from the Royal Commission um, and Ancient Historical Monuments site Covline to inform the consideration of the inventory of historic battlefields in Wales, a phase program of investigation was undertaken on the 1136 Battle of Mice Gwentlian. Detailed reports of these investigations are available and comprise documentary and historical research and non-invasive and invasive field work. Basically invasive means metal detecting, archaeological excavation, picking up pottery in the field, that type of thing. Non-invasive is sort of photographs and historical documents. The Battle of Mice Gwentlian should be viewed in the context of the breakdown of Anglo-Norman dominance across much of Central and South Wales following the death of Henry I in December 1135. Actually, um, I referred to him as Henry II. Sorry for that mistake, it's Henry I. It also rep represents the only major battle in medieval Wales in which a woman is documented as having directly commanded one of the opposing armies. Gwentlian was the wife of Griffith Apris. The, the Welsh prince of Dahibath, the territory that I've um, indicated on the map, and daughter of Gruffydd Ap Cynan, prince of Gwynedd. Just, just a little bit of a subtext. Um, in English eyes, um, the princes of Wales were referred to as princes. In Welsh eyes, we would refer to these people as being kings, rex, um, as we demonstrated last night in the lecture um, on the coin evidence. Uh, and I'd just like to sort of expand on this. I know you've heard this before, but for those that haven't, uh, when the Normans um, um, had a victory over Harold at Hastings um, in 14th of October, 1066, from that moment, uh, William the Conqueror proclaimed dominance and ownership over the whole of England. And the Queen still owns the properties that your houses are built on today. That law has not been repealed. Uh, and therefore, any prince prince in the domain of Ireland, um, um, Wales, Scotland, were to pay homage to the English king. Um, I've said that now. The only near contemporary account of the events of the battle is Gerald of Wales in the uh, uh, itinerary of um, um, Cambrai, um, Cymru, written some 50 years after the event in 1191. However, we do have another reference to um, Gwentlian, written around the same time in about 1136 by a guy by the name of Geoffrey of Monmouth. That's missing from here. Translated, we crossed. So this is what um, this is what's being said um, of um, Gerald of Wales um, is um, transcribed Latin work. We crossed the Lucha and the two Gwandraith streams and so came to Kidwelly Castle, a castle that you've seen. It was in this region after the death of Henry I, King of the English, and at a moment when her husband, Griffith Ap Rees, Prince of South Wales, had gone to North Wales for reinforcements, 
that the princess Gwentlian rode forward at the head of a, an army like some second um, Penthesilia, um, queen of the Amons, Amazons. She was beaten in battle by Maurice de, by, by Maurice de Londres. Interjection of the texture um, here, Maurice de Londres was the same person who had built um, Oyster Mouth Castle, Ogmore, and bequeathed a large amount of money for the construction of Ueni. It's also responsible for the Bishop's Palace in West Wales and the constructions with a very, very powerful Lord. Here we go, who ruled over the district and at that time and by Geoffrey, the Bishop's constable. She was so sure of victory that she had brought her sons, her two sons with her. One of them called Morgan was killed and the other called Malguin uh, was captured. Gwentlian herself had her head cut off and so did many of her followers. There's one problem with that. Um, if many of her followers had their heads cut off, why did her son Malguin survive? Um, I'm putting doubts into the documentary evidence already. And the other thing as well is, um, the question to be asked is how many people were at that battle that day? The likelihood is that um, Gwentlian probably had a force of about 500, and the Normans probably had a similar force. So it was a, no more than about 1,000 people on the battlefield. And in a moment, you can get an idea how difficult it is to find archaeological evidence. Um, and the interjection here is, is that when you, um, when people metal detect, for example, at the Battle of Gettysburg, they do find um, occasional um, um, lead, lead shot, they uh, occasional find cannonballs, um, not that they're actually using cannonballs at, um, um, they're using various canister shot, not they're using canister, um, cannonballs, um, at Gettysburg at that point. But the point is, is that even when they're metal detected at Gettysburg, where tw um, 200,000 people were involved in the battle, it, it is diff it's sometimes difficult to find artifacts. Um, with that said, to find evidence of a thousand people involved in the battlefield over a, a, a widespread area is gonna make the work for archeologists very, very difficult. And the other, feel, the other problem with a battle at this time, there is no structural evidence. Nobody built, um, um, no, nobody built um, batteries for cannons because there were no cannons in the 1100s. That's the type of evidence you're going to find at Gettysburg. Um, nobody dug trenches like you're looking at the Somme. Even the, the um, trenches at the Somme are difficult to find because they've been filled in. Uh, um, in other words, this moment, this sort of little fleck of paper that you can blow into the breeze, um, a battle that would probably took place over an hour, trying to find evidence is going to be very difficult. The battle is traditionally um, reputed to be situated within an extensive area around Mice Gwentlian Farm, um, situated some um, about a mile southeast of Kidwelly Castle. The earliest definite reference found to the place name Mice Gwentlian occurs in a deed dated to 1432. So 200 years later, that the field is referred to by that name. Um, but we have another reference the following year. Metal detector survey in 2012 over part of um, this area revealed large amounts of modern ferrous objects, as well as a reasonable amount of slightly older non-ferrous objects. So ferrous being iron and so on, non-ferrous being everything else. Uh, but no, um, finds contemporary with the battle, which is very unfortunate there. Um, so what we need to do is look at a couple more images and then we'll look at this other text that I've got. So there are memorials associated with Gwentlian. Uh, there's a memorial associated with, with Llewellyn the Last at Kill Mary. Um, I go on homage there every now and again on the 11th of December. Um, the place that um, Llewellyn was killed at Kilmary, but we don't find his body there. Um, now, what you might find associated with um, a, a battlefield like this uh, is a long armor piercing bodkin like this. Um, now, the problem is with with bodkins, um, they're connected. They're connected to arrows. They're connected to shafts. And usually after the, ba uh, the battle, 
people would go around the battlefield collecting their arrows up. So in other words, Keith is on the Norman side. Um, his fletchings on his arrows are, um, are marked in a certain way. After the battle, Keith would go up and collect all his arrows and the bodkins would be attached to them, right? So the only bodkins left on the battlefield would be those uh, that have either gone through a body completely and uh, come out the other end and that's been snapped off and gone into the ground. Some may have ended up um, being fired into a tree and obviously after the tree's rotted down, the bodkin's gonna be found. Some may have ended up in the river. Um, they have been washed away. Some would have ended up in, in the sets of skeletal remains. Those bodies would have been taken away. The bodkins remained in the body. Can you see the problems that we've got trying to find archeological evidence? Swords. Um, obviously, bits of broken sword, maybe, bits of um, bosses from shields, um, the odd bit of chain mail, maybe a little bit of armour that there wasn't a great deal of plate armour at this stage, uh, maybe a bit of a broken helmet. That's all in the archaeological evidence. So what you might find to indicate the battle is the non-ferrous objects, like little bits of pottery. But how are you going to prove that those little bits of pottery are associated with the battle. So these are the problems that archaeologists are up against. Um, these are the types of things that we're talking about, bodkins. Um, the, these are obviously reconstructed versions. One or two of these on the battlefield, and they might easily be missed by the, the best of metal detect enthusiasts. And the one thing that metal detect enthusiasts don't like is to find iron objects. Usually when a metal detect enthusiast finds an iron object, it's all encrusted with um, um, the, the sesky oxide, the, the actual rotting iron, um, iron cancer. It's all sort of exploded and gone into the soil and all the rest of it is just a lump. So usually metal detect enthusiasts find these things and so I get to toss that away. So lots of these things, even if they are found, are discarded anyway and you can't work out what they are. Um, if you are lucky, um, and for the unfortunate victims, and if I've got a book behind me, um, if I can quickly find it, um, I've got this book here. Uh, those that want to know about battles, they need to get hold of this book, book, Two Men in a Trench, by Tony Pollard and a very unknown archaeologist, Neil Oliver. Uh, this is where Neil Oliver came to uh, fruition. This was his ground mark series. And from that moment onwards, we found out he was brilliant as an archaeologist on TV. Um, he talks about um, um, evidence of damage to skulls, and so does Tony Pollard in here, little bits of evidence. They actually undertook to um, do a survey of a battlefield site, and the evidence that they found was very scant. Um, I think it was the Battle of Taunton that they looked at. I'm not really sure about that. Um, but if you are lucky, you might find that one or two people had their skulls smashed into bits on the battlefield, right? And these bits of skull were not collected after the battlefield. But you're not gonna be able to find this using a metal detector either, um, which is really unfortunate to understand the whole battlefield and to get any other evidence, right? You have to excavate the whole field. And I don't think the farmer would be too impressed with a thousand archeologists excavating the whole field going down the depth of about a foot throughout the whole field, creating a pile of spoil, which would probably be about um, 50 meters in height. So in other words, it's really difficult to find evidence associated with a battle. But if you do find bits of skull, then you are very lucky. And when we think about it, when I talk about my own little battle, the Battle of Cowbridge, um, uh, there's a tumulus there and in that tumulus there are bits of broken bones and so on and in the church as well um, where we find the evidence associated with Lamblethian church from 1896 we find lots of remains of individuals where um, there's there's battle damage on on their skulls and all the rest of it so you know um, and what you could find is a horse that's being downed um, and you might find a little bit of broken spur in the field now that's going to be nice evidence but then again, you're asking, how can you prove that that's um, a broken spur from the battlefield? You can't. What you can do is possibly work out if you get find about five of these on a bat, five of these on a field associated with a battle. Um, you, you're on the money, right? And the reason why, and, and the the reason why you're on the money is this: um, if they're all around the same date, so 11:30 11 11 odd, right? If they're all around the same date, and you've got five of them. 
it's unlikely that the average farmer is going to have spurs. Um, it's unlikely that a local landowner is going to be riding across that field. Even so, are they going to lose any spurs in the first place, right? Um, so if you, if you find five of these and they're all around the same date, that's a dead cert that they're associated with the battle. If you find any um, um, snaffle bits for a horse or any... Um, any horse bridle bits or anything like that, and they're in a large number across the field, it's an indication of a battle. But you need all these, these things to actually indicate that there's something going on. One of these is not enough evidence. It's not. Um, and this is what we're talking about. So if we want to do a survey, Mice Gwentlian, these fields here. So if you take the Gwandaleth River um, overground, all this landscape, this is the landscape that you need, look, need to look at. There's talk of some kind of a, um, a raised bank within this landscape. And it's said that that raised bank might, might be a promontory place where one of the armies commanded that day for that hour. Um, or maybe not. Do you know when we look, when we compare this with the likes of Senlac Hill and the Battle of Hastings, even then there's doubts whether, um, whether it's the yeah. spot that they say it is. Um, and I think the greatest tragedy is, is that we don't know enough about the Battle of Gwentlian, um, other than, um, Gerald of, 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 of Wales and, and Gerald, Gerald of Wales is, is, um, not a contemporary writer. He's not writing at the time. He's writing over 50 odd years later, 50, um, 55 years later. Um, and he's also biased because he's a damnable Norman to boot. Um, so we're not going to go to Sleece Rosser a minute. What we're going to do, we're going to stop my screen sharing, right? And whilst I'm looking for, whilst I'm going to get up a file on my computer, um, which is hopefully this one, um, is there anything you would like to um, um, say at this point, Keith or um, Karen? Um, not really, no, it's, it's, that's all very interesting, isn't it? But there is, as you say, it's all a lack of evidence, yeah. isn't it, really, for things? But there is, but when you, um, as, as an archaeologist, um, and to be honest with you, I don't know the next time that I'll be actually actively excavating on an arch archaeological site. Um, and um, unfortunately, guys, you've got me for the next few years because um, I, I, I won't be taking up my university post in... Um, in Sirencester because it looks like the archaeological department will be closing. So, um, um, and the reason why I mention that, you've got many more of these lectures to come. Looking at this, <laughs> looking at this document, looking at this document. Um, their loss is our gain. Exactly. And the reason why I mentioned that little bit of information there, right, is because um, when I'm writing an archaeological report in the field, um, I hope that I don't find anything because you start finding a wall it adds another 10 pages to the report you start finding artifacts it adds more pages so even an archaeological report by me where I find nothing in the field is is still 40 to 50 pages long and this is an this is an archaeological report which is 27 pages long 22 pages long um, and there's nothing in it um, that is really about archaeology associated with the Battle of Gwentlian. But I wanted to show you this. Um, I wanted to show you this because there are lots of battles out there that they're, that they're looking at. Um, Bryn, Bryn Glass, which is Pileth, which is an Old England door battle, 1402. There's lots of other ones here. There's many that's not in this list. Campston Hill, a defeat for Old England door in, in Monmouthshire. Um, Going down um, other um, um, Kragadoth, which is another defeat for Old England. Craig Maur, um, Cardiganshire is, um, and I've got to be reminded if I go into a Welsh accent, right? Tell me because on Tuesday um, the whole the whole lecture was in the Welsh accent, and they got very confused. Um, Craig Maur is the one at Cardigan um, that five thousand Normans were, were massacred um, by the Welsh in revenge for the death of Gwentlian. Um, what other ones have we got here that should be familiar? Lots of castle sieges. Um, we've got Droslein in 1287. Um, we, we got, is, is that a battle in um, 1797 when the, um, the French last invaded? At French Fishguard? invasion, yeah. Exactly. 
Uh, so we've got lots of ones here. Um, I'm not going to go through all these. Um, just sort of um, my squintly, and there it is. Um, the entry um, that we've we've mentioned, um, and as you see, there's lots of them here. Um, but there's many more that haven't been added to the list. St. Fagans, um, 1648, the, the, the last large-scale battle in Wales. Uh, and they they even still discussing where the exact locality is of the Battle of St. Fagans. Um, I don't know if any of you have parked at the back car park at St. Fagans, um, but it's said that um, where the back car park is at St. Fagans, as you get off the bypass, all those fields are associated with the battle. But I'm still not even sure that that's the case either. So as you go down mm. the as you go down in this document, I know I'm I'm going through it, and we've we've looked at most of this. Uh, we've looked at this background already. Uh, the narrative to the battle, as we know, um, it's it's said that um, Gwentlian um, is beheaded. The aftermath is um, very much in the eyes of Gerald of Wales from this document. Um, we've already we've already mentioned that account, um, and there is something quite strange about that entry. Um, Gerald of Wales is writing fifty years later, um, and if I read um, um, this following um, um, paragraph, if you can make sense of this, um, it might indicate that what Gerald is describing is another battle and not the Battle of Gwentlian. A possible allusion to the ruthless treatment of Gwentlian and other captured Welsh prisoners after the battle is contained in a later passage um, in which Gerald refers to the terrible vengeance exacted in our own times by the King's troops on the subjects of Cantreth Maur. This passage has been interpreted by some scholars as referring to the execution of Gwentlian and of followers after the battle. However, while this is, is certainly plausible, it is not explicitly stated in the text. Moreover, Gerald, Gerald's reference to this event having taken place in our own times suggests that it occurred during his own lifetime, which would seem to rule out a direct association with the events of the battle. And why, why have we done this section about Gwentlian? The reason why we've done this section about Gwentlian is to explain how difficult and how um, hard it is to interpret the past. Um, is, is, this, um, is this the uh, a description of Gerald of Wales about the battle or is it about another event? And as you go through this text, you're ass assessing um, assessing the assessment of the battle uh, landscape, we know that there's a reference in 1432 of Mice Gwentlian um, on um, land deeds, Gwentlian's field, um, and then the interpretation is um, by the 1500s that this is the place of the Battle of Gwentlian. It, it could actually refer to something else. And um, and the thing, the problem is that what we find is that when we come to place names on maps, as we started off with, when we get a field referred to as Arthur's field, was Arthur ever there? Um, and again, it's referred to in 1647. And as things go by, with reference to, to the battle, thing. Um, we've got to be very wary of um, the way history is written. And whenever people pick up a book um, from, say, the 1800s, 1900s, it's the given that you always believe everything that's written about in a book written by an antiquarian. Um, it's also said that um, Gerald of, of Wales um, um, had somebody else writing back in 1136, Geoffrey of Monmouth, which I've already mentioned. I would like to look at this quickly as well. Um, looking at um, the, uh, the, um, the Battle of Gwentlian, um, in 1841, um, a playwright, um, Evan Andrews, wrote about Gwentlian or the Siege of Kidwelly um, in 1841. Um, 
he writes about this event. Where is he getting his information from? Gwentlian in, um, is written about in the Heroines of Welsh History um, in 1854 by a certain Llewellyn Pritchard. Provides a lengthy, highly rom uh, romanticized account of the battle, which appears to be wholly conjectured and not based on documentary evidence. But when people um, like Cadu are writing about Gwentlian, they, they've made Gwentlian into a god. You go to Kidwelly Castle and it's Gwentlian this, Gwentlian that. And the only reference, the only evidence that we've got to Gwentlian being there is the account um, of Gerald of Wales that might not be describing um, that exact battle. Um, and then when we sort of move on, um, it's sort of taken seriously by the Royal Commission on Ancient Historical Monuments um, um, about this battle. And actually the Royal Commission on Ancient Historical Monuments do not recognize the Battle of Cowbridge, even though I've got more evidence for the Battle of Cowbridge than we have for this one. In 1811, it's, um, it's written down by the Ordnance Survey um, on one of their publications. And then um, the, one thing about, the one thing about Welsh history is the way it's going. And I think this last section here needs to be read out. In regional terms, the victory of Maurice de Londres and his allies at Mice Gwentlian was of considerable importance, effectively securing Anglo-Norman control of the Kidwelly area, the Kamot of Kidwelly, basically a parish area. Although it did not prevent further Welsh raids on the castle and town and its capture uh, by the Lord Rhys Ap Griffith, uh, youngest son of Gwentlian and Griffith Ap Rhys in 1190. In a national context, however, Gwentlian's defeat of Kidwelly appears to have of relatively little political significance. Compared to the substantial victories gained um, in the Gower by the Welsh Lucca, um, and the Grieg Maur also in 1136, both of which are comparatively much better covered in both English and Welsh chronicle sources, and which can be demonstrated uh, to have substantially undermined the Anglo, um, uh, the Anglo Norman uh, control of South and West Wales. However, the Battle of Mice Gwentlian is nonetheless important. Um, important as it represents the only major battle in medieval Wales in which a woman in, is docu in documentary um, evidence is mentioned and commanded um, one of the armies at the battle. The brutal summary execution of Gwentlian, a princess of the House of Gwynedd, together with many of her captured followers, clearly left a lasting legacy of fear and resentment in the surrounding region as evidenced by Gerald of Wales's account written in 1191. However, the present culture, cultural importance of Gwentlian is largely due to the efforts of antiquarians in the 1800s, authors and playwrights, which can ultimately be traced back to one single account of Gerald of Wales. And the danger in history is, is that you need more evidence to understand the past um, than we have in the case of the Battle of Gwentlian. But, I will bow down to greater wisdom and agree that the Battle of Mice Gwentlian did take place at the location near Kidwelly. So what I'd like to do now, I'd like to introduce Llys Rossir, um, is where we're going to go now. So we've got another image of Gwentlian, and for a very short while, we're going to be looking at Llys Rossir and much more of that after the break. Now. Karen and Keith, um, did Hello. you know anything about the Battle of Mice Gwentlian before this lecture today? No. no. I've never heard of it. No. No, never heard of it. As you say, most of these Welsh battles are, are just not documented. There's very few books on Welsh battles. I've got a couple, but there's very little information that's real, you know, substantial. substantial. I, I, I've, got, I've got a book about, I, I, I think I've got, you know, that little... Um, the, the battlefield guide that would come out about 50 years ago. I think you've probably got that one. And I think you go through the whole one. And I don't think there's, I think there's only one battle that ever took place in Wales in that book. And I think that's probably St. Fagans. There's no, no, no battles of Owen Glyndwr recorded and nothing about the Welsh princes. And I keep reminding, I keep saying to you all, this is not, um, this is not a lecture about Welsh nationalism. Um, this, this is to try and, tell you that um, 
there's more out there than just the Romans. There's more out there than just um, burial chambers or, or, or Iron Age hell forts. There's more out there than the damnable Normans. In other, in other words, what I'm trying to do yes. is level yes. the balance. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say that they're, um, out of all those pages that you've got in your dictionary, you forgot March, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is Khalees Rossir. And, and, and another question I'm going to ask both of you two, Karen and Keith, are you ever aware of this Welsh palace on Anglesey? Have you ever heard of it? No. Uh. Again, um, a no. And um, the, um, obviously... Um, what I'm going to try and do when we're going to be looking at um, when we're looking at the archaeology of, of events in history, um, I've got to try and grab a major event in history that's recorded in the ground in the archaeology. And that's going to be very difficult for me to do because I, I, I kind of stay away from buildings and all sorts of things like that. And it's going to be very difficult for me to find, but I promise I will find one. AD 1300, mm. actually AD 1282, 1282. Um, three, um, a Welsh prince's palace, um, and I've and I've uh, I've gone back into using the term Welsh and Wales for this lecture, um, and obviously next week I'll do Cymru, Cymraeg, and Cymraeg, um, just to keep everybody happy. Before the conquest of Wales by Edward the First in 1283, uh, the Welsh kingdoms were flourish flourishing. Um, you had um, De Haybath in, in, in West Wales, you had um, Gwynedd, um, you had Powys. Um, the ones in South Wales were a bit weird, like Sir Henneth, um, and, um, and, and, and the ones that tried to hang on in Gwent, right? But other than that, those three mage king kingdoms that I've mentioned are flourishing. Um, it's a time, here we go, there are native Welsh castles. Um, and it's saying, but these are late and peripheral. Um, whoever wrote this must be English by referring to a Welsh castle as being peripheral um, um, needs their, their head examined because lots of Welsh castles built by Welsh princes are far from peripheral. Uh, the centre of uh, Welsh culture lay in the royal courts, the, the Llis. Um, for the first time one of these Llisoed um, is now being excavated at Rossir. Now, I'm glad I've got this account. This account goes back to um, 1994, 1995 and six. The site was discovered in 1992. Um, and referring back to the lecture last night, um, lots of people don't know that it was still illegal to um, speak Welsh um, in 1993 when the uh, laws were repealed. So this is how far we are, if we're that far behind on the Welsh language, this is how far we are on our own heritage and history. Um, so finding this lease, I, I, was, I was really pleased when I was um, um, back in 1993, um, when I heard about this, I, I was over the moon. I, I, went, I went all the way to Anglesey on the train and I actually saw, um, I saw this, this site, it was, it was wonderful. It, it, for years and years, I had been told by my school teachers that nobody lived in Wales between the Romans, uh, Roman civilization collapsing in 1066. That's what I was told because there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing out there. Um, and even, 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 art, even medieval pottery produced in Wales, there was none of it. There was nothing. None existed um, in the 1980s. A little bit did exist, but when I say nothing existed, um, produced in Welsh kilns, nobody really knew much. Um, all those different levels of building up that information. This is what we're doing. So that there, um, and today we've got, we've got two plans. We've got a plan of the archaeological excavations, as you can see the, the stone, and we've got a little plan alongside so we can work out what's going on. R rather rather, rather um, interesting the way I've put this together today. Here, here uh, we see the excavations at an early stage. Note the level ground and the great fertility of the Isle of uh, Anglesey. In the background are the narrow strait um, that separates Anglesey, so they've got the little water there. Um, mm. And um, that, the, that in the um, distance is actually Snowdonia. <coughs> um, so you've got Snowdonia in the background. So again, this site, this site um, would have dominated the landscape, would have, would have been, you know, if it managed to get to 
a first story building, ground first story building. It would have been the tallest building within the landscape. And it would, you could have, I'm not saying you would have, could have seen it from Snowdonia, but um, um, you could have certainly seen it for miles around. Um, line of sight, maybe, not sure there, Keith. Um, so one, one thing that I was clearly missing when, um, one thing that I was clearly missing um, was artifacts in the form of pottery. And this pottery itself, um, it, uh, very similar to the uh, examples that were excavated at Cosmaster Medieval Village and examples that you find in York and uh, um, Chester and those types of places. But this again, the type of um, medieval pottery that you would actually find on the tables of the princes and kings and lords and lots of the aristocracy in Britain. And that there, these, th that jug is a Santonia jug from France, which would be the type of, type of table status wares that you have had, the Santonia ware, um, which is, was extensively excavated at Cosmeston Medieval Village. I, I love my excavations at Cosmeston Medieval Village because it was always um, when, um, when, when you were finding this very glossy pottery, you were very privileged to actually find it. But the very glossy pottery came from the manor house, not the rest of the village, villagers' houses. Um, and I, I, um, there's one rather interesting thing. When I was field walking a few years ago at a place called Cum Kiddy, um, we, uh, we were walking across the field, and I haven't told this story for ages, West Ridge. We were trying to find the remains of a Roman villa a farmstead. And it's in my book, The Romans in the Vale of Morgan. Um, and I was looking across the field and, and my colleague went across to the other side of the field. I was on top of the ridge and I screamed, oh, wow, I find a, found a bit of Roman Samian ware in this field. I was screaming, jumping up and down. And he didn't run across the field. And I thought, why, why aren't you running across the field? I found a bit of Roman glaze, uh, um, uh, not glazed, I found this Roman Samian ware from, from France and it had a nice little lion on it, it was brilliant. But it was a really worn bit of Roman Samian ware. It was obviously being, um, you know, a, 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 a Samian ware bowl, um, Dragondorf type, I think, um, year 120 years AD from, from, from Gaul. Um, and um, and when, I, um, when I was looking at this, it turned out to have loads of wear on it. And it was probably the only Samian bowl that this family had. And obviously they weren't aristocracy. It wasn't a Roman villa and so on. And I kept shouting to this guy, God, Stuart, why aren't you? Anyway, I had to go over to him. He'd only found 200 bits of medieval pottery in a corner of a field, all basically in the corner of the field on the surface. Right. I was over the moon. And the reason why I hadn't run across the field is because he found pottery like this, glazed bits of pottery. And I said, I said, oh, forget about this Roman bit of pottery, Stuart. Right. Look at what you found. It was unbelievable what he'd found that day on the surface. Um, and this was this would probably be may, maybe part of um, um, you know where the manor house is associated in that field. And um, again, this is a type of stuff that they would have found at Cleese Rosser, um, but not exactly the stuff that they had actually found there. But very similar to the artifacts there. Um, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to do um, um, that little bit of information. Um, and I'd like to show you where this is and we'll, we'll take a break and we will open the mics for questions. So um, this is known as the Hundred of Gwynedd, um, the, the um, kingdom, the princely kingdom of Aberfrau. This is the area of Aberfrau. Aberfrau is the house name for the princes of Gwynedd as when we look at um, the royal family, they're the Windsors, um, Windsor Castle. Um, but they're the British royal family. Um, and this is the princes of Aberthrow, the royal family of Gwynedd, eventually the royal family of Cymru, the royal family of Wales. Um, and just, just a little bit of um, factual information. Uh, the reason why we've got Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, um, is because um, this, is, this, is, um, this is derived from the ridicule of the Welsh princes. So in other words, Edward I said, I will give my son to be the Prince of Wales. In other words, the people of Wales can only ever have a prince because I am the English King of Wales. Okay, so this is what that means. 
Um, so it's a derided title um, to be given the title Prince of Wales. Um, and I wouldn't be proud of it if I was uh, Prince Charles. Um, so that's where we go. That's Aberfrau. You can see the site today. Um, you, it's, I think it gets a little bit overgrown now and it's not really loved and respected, which is a bit of a shame. Don't get me nationalistic because down here you've got Bumaris Castle treated like a wonderful Norman castle that it is. For a site associated with the Welsh princes, it's got a sign there and the walls and that's it. Um, and if we look at this text finally, uh, before we have a break, at this point we must pause and make a brief excursion into the Welsh laws. According to the laws, a primary division of a kingdom was the cantref, literally 100 townships. Each cantref was subdivided into two commotes. Uh, and that being, um, a, my translation of what that's saying there, you've got one area do, de dedicated to the Lord or the Prince and one dedicated to the people. Um, and you've got the idea of townships, you've got the idea of division, of territory. Um, and when, when, we, when we think about this site, and we're going to go into it, these are the remains uh, before they did a little bit of restoration work. Um, um, and that's what we're going to look up after the break. So what we're going to do, um, I've got my castle behind me. Um, and Gillian's looking rather dapper today, I've got to be honest with you. I've, un I've unmuted you all, okay? Um, and I see Penny still with us. Um, <laughs> so, um, right. Anyone got any questions? No. Do we know what happened to Gwenllian's second son who was reputedly taken away and captured? The answer, is, the answer is he may have survived, but we don't have any more than that. And what, we, what I'm going to do is that um, when, we're doing, when we're doing our um, Wednesday evenings, um, I think one of the topics will be to sort of trace some of these missing people, like um, Gwentlian of, um, of Flewell in the last, who ended up in a priory. She disappeared. She basically... Um, I think they may have told her on, on a deathbed that she was um, the true princess of Wales. Um, Excuse me, somebody at the door. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone, anyone, anyone got any questions? Um, Goff? Yeah. No. Yeah, um, you talk, talked about um, Cwm Kivy. Now, back in 1968, 69, when I was a young man, I used to go to a nightclub called the Cwm Kivy Manor. North of Newport. Mm. Is it the same oh. place? No, it's I, I have I thought you were going to talking about something else then, but no, it's Cum Kiddy outside Barry. So you've got Barry. Um, I don't know if you have you ever been to the Cum Kiddy uh, Arms or whatever it is and had a, a carvery? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I passed yeah. it on the bus. Right, if you go down that little road down there, right? There's a farm uh -huh. at the end. Um, yes. Yes. Whatever you do, don't drive your car down there because the farmer doesn't like people driving his cars down there. Um, walk down there and as you go left, um, over the stile, you, you go towards a cottage, which is then at the mouth of uh, the likes of uh, Porth Kerry Park. And just before you get to that yeah. cottage, if you look at the footpath, you can see the remains of the village, a wall going across it. Okay, different place then. Okay, different place. Can I just can I just say uh, that if anyone's got any places that they would like me and Rosamond to visit, um, and they would like a video of it, just just let me know. Um, I'm not going to have 20 suggestions off everyone, but if there's something you've really wanted to know about, i.e., East Orchard Castle, um, that will be one of the first places that Rosamond and I go to. Well, I don't think you ought to be going around all these places, Carl, because we're. You know, unless it's a necessary journey, it is. I don't think we be going. I'm serious. They've been stopping people going down the beach. Someone drove all the way from well, Swindon. Swindon. <laughs> really? Swindon. Thank really? God. 
you've actually you've actually you've actually missed missed this this is this is this is done under the authority of the Vale of Morgan County Council so um it's not just done on a whim so there you go well, Boris might be releasing us all on Sunday, mightn't he? Hopefully, so we'll have to yeah. wait and see. Uh, well, we, Boris doesn't count. It's Mark Drayford. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, course, yeah. <laughs> Let's not get political. Let's have one sensible question off somebody. <laughs> no? Um, what yeah. you showed in the very first screen, Carl. Yeah. Did you say they were found at Cosmaston? Yes. Oh uh, no yes. no no! Some of those some of those types have been found at Cosmaston, but there are other examples in that collection that I showed you from places like York and uh, else, elsewhere. So. Right, but the, but the very first two, the very first screen of today. Oh yeah, the the, the first the two. two yeah, you two, said you broke it. Those those two, yeah, those two, Cosmaston. <laughs> yes, uh, well, they no. were found at Cosmaston. Yes, but then so going flash forward to the other screens uh, the other pots they, they've been found all over the country is that right that's right that's right that's right yeah, uh, that is correct so if nobody's got any other questions we'll take a 10 minute break and i can have a cup of tea okay okay, okay. i'll put the kettle on right, Bring cake. <laughs> <should this>, Keith. <laughs> So let's um, let's take a break. Okay. Two sugars. What? He's not on two sugars. He's a silly man. Where's the iPad? Joe. Joe. Chris. Karen. Sue. Jay. Andrea, Goff, Roz, Penelope, and Pam. Okay. Do you know what? I'm going to change my screen. You don't need this, do you? Claim all the housing benefits and you don't need those. She's already complaining about it. She said she's had a, she had a drink last night. She said, you're going to go over to the shop to get milk. And then she said, well, it would be better not leave me here. Uh, and I'm going to bring something to drink. I said, she's got a car. She can go over and help you with them. Who's that for you? What do you do is, is help you out? Who's got in there? I know you said to her, you sure you want to live in next door to you? Oh, okay. Stuff and CD. Oh, CD. Oh, okay. What's the date? All right. Then. Um. You can find the characters. I 
be coming to Barry Carl one day this week. Uh, oh, he's, I think he's doing something. He's, got, <laughs> he's playing with himself. He's playing with himself. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, oh my god. Disappeared. Blah. He's turned his mic off, I think. Hello. Hello. I'm at, at archaeology. I'm just having my coffee break. Can I call you at the end? <clears throat> oh, some bread, please. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll do. Yes, because it's good for toast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okie dokie. Right here. Bye bye. Bye bye. See ya. Bye bye. Anybody want any shopping from the <laughs> corner shop? <laughs> oh, a couple of bottles of gin, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> I have to apologise for being late, uh, but it was Karen's fault. All right. She, she dropped some um, <laughs> of my natural hair dye round. So I'm, I'm restored to my natural colour now. You've not Karen. put the pink in yet then? Yeah, yeah, it was oh. your fault. Oh, there is some pink in there. All right, I can't yeah. see very well on yeah. this. All right. no, no, it's really yeah, good, actually. Pink it up a bit more. Well, it's my natural colour. <laughs> matches my nose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, now I feel restored. Oh, what's, it, what's the name of it? Because I want to do something what? with mine. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it's called Pixie Lot Paint. Oh right. Yeah. <laughs> does it last does it last very long? Well, this is a bit of a new experiment. All right. I'll be able, I'll be able to report. <laughs> and um but and we didn't use it all. So it's got lots of sort of further applications. Right, and you just you just paint it on as it says on the, on the tin. <laughs> paint it on, and then just 
wash it off with with warm water and that's where I went wrong because I didn't really quite allow enough time (laughs) 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 so um, so that thing of somebody down on the beach from Swindon yeah there were people people the other day we were walking down and, and some motorbikes came up and then shortly afterwards there was a guy coming up and said oh don't go down to the beach today the police are chasing everybody off yeah, oh, yeah, nice. the, yeah. They've um, my mum's next door neighbours were on a walk and they met a policewoman who was really incensed because she hadn't seen a daughter for eight weeks and she was checking on all the car registrations and seeing if they were local or not. And anyway, people who are local aren't supposed to drive down the beach either. And I, I think they caught someone from Swindon and there was someone from the west of England as well. I think. Wow. Yeah, on the same day. I mean, it's totally... Was that Bank Holiday Monday? No, Um, it was was this last weekend, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of people, there's lots of visitors to Lump. We we saw a couple of Chinese that were obviously uh, visitors because they asked us the way to the beach. Ah. And... um, Quite a lot walking, you know, we do one quite isolated walk up past Rosedew. Yeah. And I'm sure they've got their um, people in. Well, I, we so, see lots know. of cars parked outside the chalets and things up there when I walk past. Yeah, There's I think it's cars. a lot of like NHS workers oh, who are right. staying in the chalets yeah. so they don't infect their families. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they are definitely because the same cars have been there for a long time. Yeah. But I don't think so. Uh, on the actual caravan park, I think they're just holiday makers. There's not I many, thought they weren't are. allowed to go there. No, all, all the campsites no. are meant to be shut, aren't they? Yeah. Caravan parks, yeah. Not. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we, we saw a whole load of cars with stickers on, police stickers on, um, mm-hmm. on Bank Holiday Monday down by the beach road. Yeah, yeah. So. To be honest, I think they should find people. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> oh, they are. Oh, they are, are they? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bringing out your punitive side. <laughs> stone them, stone them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, no. I'm drawing quarters. Yes, yes. Let's get Let's back to proper law and order. Yeah. yeah. Let's set up a gallows in Gallows Lane. Yes. Hey, yeah. <laughs> right Take by the sign that. where it says no access to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> a gibbet <laughs> with somebody swinging in it. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, there's a little one that comes round, the council van telling us all to stay in. Yeah. Check the NHS. Yeah, I've heard that, yeah. yeah. Mm. So it says it in Welsh first as it goes down the cul de sac. And in English. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I, on behalf of Goff, who's just phoned me, complain about your bickering sounding like an old woman's meeting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm off. Bye. Well, it's an old woman's meeting. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I always thought you were trying to eat, Keith. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I thought you were a tranny. Yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> I'll be anything that you say after six weeks locked in. <laughs> yeah. oh. Any interaction is a good interaction now. Exactly. <laughs> Can't be fussy, can we? No. <laughs> Keith, I think you and me are the only one that's staying in. That's true, I think, yeah. Quiet. Me. What else are you no. around? Me. Oh no, I'm, I'm a bang, I'm a law-abiding citizen, you see. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm not 70 yet though, so I can go out. <laughs> oh, Chris, can do some problems. shopping? <laughs> <laughs> can I send you my shopping list? <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. I only go to the shops <laughs> once a week with rubber <laughs> gloves on. <laughs> yeah, I only go to Waitrose and Calvary's once a week. Yeah. Are you wearing a mask when you go out now, Chris? Not yet, but I think I might because people are starting to get a bit blase about the two metre rule. Yes. <laughs> oh, poor Jim is still still in, in quiet zone. He's putting up signs. <laughs> Can you unmute me, Carl? Carl <laughs> 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 oh, oh, why is there a lovely chicken? 
Oh, oh, Jim, you're, you're, you're second to the chicken, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken's getting attention and you're not. <laughs> I had some bloke come around here with a car yesterday with a microphone on it, with a loudspeaker telling me to stay in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've had it round, yeah. yeah. Normally about 12, isn't it, it comes to me. <laughs> Should be here it, soon. It, it went by this morning while we were here, but um, the windows are shut, so it didn't interrupt yeah. us. Oh. No, You're no. obviously not taking any notice of him, Rosalind. <laughs> <laughs> Wandering around the countryside. Going down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. It's a black chicken, is it? Or is it a turkey? No, it's a black chicken. <laughs> a turkey. Oh, right. <laughs> it's a black chicken. A black chicken? Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. I've never heard of a black chick. I've heard of a black swan. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you've got to believe in it now because she's there. There yeah. you go. Does she lay black eggs? <laughs> no, she actually lays white eggs. Oh, that's discrimination. Yeah. So it's really pretty. So, um, so what's I'm her name? What's her name? Oh, we we haven't actually Blackie. got. An, we haven't actually got a Blackie. name for this one. Oh. Uh, yeah. Why oh. <laughs> Jim Jim sent several signs while you were out collecting your chickens because he's muted still. <laughs> Help. Oh, can you oh, was hang that on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I I'm, I'm just I'm just gonna put it back, so I'm gonna um hang on. Uh, just 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 in case she does something. <laughs> <laughs> You're still, still lower than the chicken there, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. yeah, I'm really thrilled with this, Chris. But Don't know where, I got it for Yeah, I got it. I got it, oh, I shouldn't say this, I got it for Cameron's Christmas present, but seeing she bought me a diary, which has been entirely <laughs> useless this year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad I got her the pixie lot, which was the wrong colour for you, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, I could do with some of that. <laughs> oh, no, no, Jim, your, your witch of a missus was behind you then. She's yeah. behind you. <laughs> he can't say anything, Carl, because you've moved. Hi. <laughs> I'm a witch. Is muted. Are you going to unmute Jim, Carl? Or just leave yeah. him muted. Good. Right. Leave him hanging. <laughs> but I'm I'm on. I've gone now. Hey, <laughs> oh, <laughs> hi there, Jim. Hey. Hey. <laughs> he lets out of prison, isn't it, Jim? Yeah. Uh, he is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where did Carl have his hand? <laughs> you don't want to know. Is <laughs> he getting an egg out? <laughs> um, it's Big Bar. Who's that? That's the dog's tail. Um, oh, I'm going to say cheerio to everyone. Oh, you wish, Carl. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> What's that, Pam? Oh. I'm going to say cheerio to everyone. It's getting a bit okay. frisky here. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll, we'll put your mic off. Tell your dog to get. Off your leg. <laughs> I can't. I can't even mute her. Right. Okay. Um, right. Uh, Pen Penelope left a message here. She said, "Hi all. I need to sign off. Really love to join the class today. Thank you, Carl. It is all very interesting. I'm trying to leave, but it's very funny listening to you all. Bye, bye all. <laughs> we're a very strange lot. <laughs> yes, a very, very strange lot." Hey Carl. Yeah. I got those are the two books I've got on Welsh battles. Lift them up. Lift them up. I've got the, I've got the one on the left. Yeah. Your left the, or my right? Uh, the the, the one, one by Philip for Philip Warner. That's the one I've got. All right. And the other one's by someone called Dillis Gator. 
Oh, you don't, you don't have, you don't have anyone called Phyllis writing a book. No, that's just, that's just one. <laughs> so, um, so right. Um, just, just, just a few announcements. Um, um, obviously, um, blah, blah, blah. right next, next week we, we will be looking at the, um, the archeology span of, uh, the Teutonberg forest in regards to Varus, um, and the destruction of his, um, three legions. Um, those, those that, um, are aware we're making great progress with the allotment. Um, and anyone that has got any, um, sort of Roman or pre, um, Roman species of things that they want to plant, plant like herbs and so on, they need to let us know. Um, I need a volunteer that can contact me privately, um, to do a session like this, looking at the archeology span of the erotica of Egypt. <laughs> because 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 um my my video on the archaeology of the erotica of rome um as as up to twelve thousand views at this moment it's my most popular video <laughs> uh, and so what i want to do is do i want to do another one in the series so if somebody wants to do a session like this and we look at images saying you know look at the way that woman's figure is there and look at look at that sort of position they're in and sort of be really prim and proper right um, let me know afterwards. There might be more than two. There might be more than one of you. Um, Keith might want to do it. <laughs> Only if Kathy's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> she, she might on a new tablet. Um, it, it'll be a sister. It'll be a sister Wendy type um, recording. Um, so what else was I going to say? Obviously, everyone, not to forget. Um, we, we've got uh, Saturday where we're doing Monk Nash. Any, everyone who joins that next Wednesday, we'll be looking at um, the archaeology and history of, of the battlefields of Wales, actually. That's what we're doing next Wednesday evening. Um, anyone interested in any, any of them, stay behind at the end and have a chat. And the final thing that's been mentioned is that um, those that uh, uh, want to get together for, for a forum chat, which isn't a class or anything, um, and they feel that they want to chat with others using Zoom, um, we, can, uh, we can let you use this. Um, just let me know afterwards and you can set up a bit of a forum. What we need to do is we need to crack on. And we've got, we're going to crack on with an article of the week. Um, guess what? So here we go. There's, do you know, when, when I do this on the screen, you can't really... What's happening with the green screen? I don't know. Mm, anyway. A bit funny. There, there you go. That, that image there, right? It's an article, Greeks were not mis misogynists. Um, Natalie Haynes thinks well, modern translations of Homer have added misogyny to their ancient stories. When Emily Wilson's 2017 translation of the Odyssey came out, she was pilloried for what uh, was seen as revisionism. The best example is the slave girls at the end of the story who were killed by Odysseus. Translations from the 1800s dubbed these women as sluts or whores or women from Barry. Um, but not such, um, uh, not, not such um, exists in the original Greek or Wilson's um, simple translated accordingly. When you strip away the last 200 years of prejudice, you change the meaning of a poem as most people know it. So in other words, uh, these were slave girls and not sluts. But that, that's, the art, that's the only article I've got. Sorry, it's disappointing. Um, oh. Right, so okay. what I'm going to do, I've it's had enough of Keith. It's thought-provoking, um, Carl. It is thought-provoking, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, slave girls put in that position. Yeah, exactly. It's not very nice, yeah. What about yeah. slave boys? That's the type of thing Gillian's yeah. in. <laughs> well, they've got to be over 18 and under 20. Um, I don't know why I just thought I'd put that in. There. Right, so who You're are rambling who, again. I, I am. So I want um, the people who I want to join my lecture now. Um, uh, I'll, have, I'll have Gillian for once. I, I don't often hear her voice. I'll have Gillian and Jane. You won't hear it much today, Carl. <laughs> Okay, then I won't have you, Gillian. I will have no. Jane. Oh, uh, what about Jane and Jim? Yeah, J Jane and Jim. That'll do. Jane and Jim. Yeah, double J's. Yeah. Right. Rosie and Jim. 
Yeah, <laughs> Rosie and Jim. Right. Okay, I'm going to mute you all, and I'm going to bring Rosie and Jim back on. So, uh, bye bye. Right. Hiya, Jim. <laughs> Come on. Oh, hi, Jim. Hi there, Carl. Long, uh, long time no speak. Yeah, it's 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 good, isn't it? It's good. So, so um, so what we're going to do? Um, we're going to go to um, we're going to go back to where we were. Um, how the fleece was discovered. Now that's a really interesting um, avenue to start off with. Um, so, what I'm going to do is do I'm going to test out the technology and do something else as well. Um, so I'm just going to try and get a site plan up as well. So if we can have two things on the screen at once, I'm not sure this is going to work. Um, and okay, we've got that there. Uh, we get rid of that. Um, and we get that smaller. We get rid of that. We get rid of that. Get rid of that. That. I'll have it sorted in a minute. And that there. I've got so many windows open. Oh, God. Right, okay. So, oh, right. So, what are you seeing on your screen now? A picture of a something or other. How the fleece was discovered. <laughs> uh, have you got another image on the screen as well? No, just some text. And at the bottom is a picture of the like. Um, oh damn it! Uh, the lease. The lease. <laughs> I, I I was I That's was hope, I was hoping you'd have the two things on the screen at once. Um, ah. you, you're only getting the one, which is. A, Oh, hang on. Here we go. Um, bingo. What can you see now? Same. Same thing. Same thing. Oh, no, two. Ah, yes. yeah. Two images. Do you know, do you know what? I, I am so wonderful sometimes. You know what I mean? I've just, um, I, 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 I surpass my greatness. <laughs> I'm just going to make this a bit bigger because I know what will happen. Chris at the back of the room, she will complain that she can't see anything. Um, you know, I, I, I miss being in that little room with, with Chris and Lynn. Do you, do you miss that room, Jim? Yeah. <laughs> it's very intimate, isn't it? Uh, mm. and, 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 and unfortunately, the latest is that we won't, be, um, we won't be going back to that room. It's more like CF61. Right, so what, what we've got here is we've got um, on the right-hand drawing, um, and we've got how the lease was discovered. Until 1996, they had no idea that the ground plan was the ground plan, as you see it on the right. Um, so the lease at Rossa lies just outside the town of Newborough, about a mile away which was one of Edward I's new boroughs. Here we see the, the main hall at the foreground. So this here is the main hall. Um, and then further over um, to, towards, and it's saying about the background. So what we've got, we've got, uh, there we've got that. We've got the church in the background on the other image. Um, and this suggests that the church was ancient and indeed it was sacked by the Normans in 1157. It's likely that the church was there before the palace was constructed. Um, and the field adjacent was called, this field was called Kaya Fleece. And this suggested to the excavator, David Longley, the director of the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust, that this might be the site of the original fleece. Now it's quite strange, but it wasn't definite that this was the fleece, the place of, um, of Llewellyn, um, um, the, the great Llewellyn at Yurith's palace. No, nobody put the two together. It seemed obvious, but nobody had actually experimented with that fact. Um, so what we've got, we've got two plans alongside each other at this minute, and it's showing that um, what we have in the archeology span on this plan on the left, that this thing here uh, is actually the perimeter wall and actually goes a lot further south. There's a wall on the south, and it goes all the way along, um, and it goes north again. So in other words, the area that the Sleece is at Sleece Rossa is twice the size shown uh, in the illustration on the right. So it, it's twice the area. It's quite a large area uh, that this palace is um, constructed um, on. 
Um, and there's one thing that can be said, and I'm not just jesting here, not to get with the Joneses, it's likely if, uh, if Llewellyn had defeated Edward I, which is really highly unlikely, but if he had defeated um, Edward I, this would, be the, this would be a palace site uh, the size of Kensington Palace now, or, um, or Windsor, or any of those great palaces um, of the present day monarchy, it would be a lar as large as those. And the point is, the, the clue to what I've just said is actually in this little thing on the right. This is actually a corridor. And what they decided initially when they built, built these buildings uh, in the earlier part of the, um, in the earlier part of the 1200s, even in the 1100s. Um, but whenever the earlier buildings were built, they were separate buildings, like um, this building up here in the north, a smaller hall, maybe another building. They were all separate buildings. They weren't all linked together. But in the, um, by around the 1250s, the 1260s, um, it all, they were building all little corridors um, between, the, between the halls and the buildings. So you didn't have to go outside um, in the rain to get to another room. That's what we're talking about. Innovation of architectural um, structures. Um, so here we, here we can begin to see uh, the plan of how the lease was laid out. We don't know the full plan of all the buildings um, and I don't have that evidence in front of me. This work was done in 1996. Uh, really before LIDAR, um, really before, um, it's, it's the time that um, Time Team is just about <coughs> using geophysics and I haven't got that data with me unfortunately. This is all based on the 1996 work. Uh, the palace buildings lay um, in a walled courtyard which we can clearly see and the surrounding wall still survived three feet high in places so that's that's fantastic a meter high wall still standing and this thing was missed um and what we have um those that have been to my talk about welsh castles you will know that the welsh princes um and the welsh lords built uh, they didn't build um gate houses uh, they they basically built walls with a little um um, doorway in between um, which was their gateway and this was similar to a palace site as it was to a castle site they didn't like to build um, gatehouses so in other words you're going from straight from the outside into through the through the little um, gateway here and you're going into this bit of the courtyard and directly in front of you is the hall now you wouldn't do that with a Norman site but you did it with a Welsh site I think I think Welsh building Welsh building has got, it's got its own sense of architecture. You know, when we, um, for example, this is a really good point. Sorry to bandy on about this, but not really going to apologise. When you look at some um, books of British architecture, you always get um, Norman architecture, you early English and sort of perpendicular style and Tudor and Stuart, right? But you never ever get the white, a Welsh style of building which is really unique, may I add. Um, so what, what, this, what the note also says on the left is that the hall here overlies an earlier hall. You can see here that this is an earlier hall. And if you take the, the cursor here, uh, the length is approximately 20 meters in length, give or take a meter or so. Um, and it's over 10 meters wide. So you can imagine this is quite a wide hall. You can't see it from the ground there, but it's quite a wide hall. It's quite an impressive hall. Probably slightly different from Norman halls, which were a lot more longer and slender. Um, if, if I think the comparison I need to make is probably the likes of Ogmore Castle or maybe some of the halls at um, Coity or something like that. Um, but these are more chunkier, uh, robust, uh, manly halls than the Norman versions. Um, is it is there evidence of it having a moat? Yes, yes, yes. Now this is the thing. Do you call it a fleece or do you call it a castle? That's a really good point. And, and the, there's a point to be made there. And I can't, I can't get the image up here now, but the point to be made here is that whenever you, um, okay, you know, um, um, here's a question for you, Jim. Barry, is that, is that a castle or a manor house at Barry? When I talk, when I talk um, about Barry Castle. That's hard to tell, there's not much left of it. 
Okay, okay. It's, it's, no, it's a manor house, but it looks like a castle, right? The, the, prob ah. the, pro the problem is the differentiation between a manor house, a castle, and a fleece is very fine. Um, all of them have got ditches around them, so they're defensive in one way, shape, or form. Or, as I did my master's degree in access analysis in archaeology, uh, the ditch itself is, is, um, is a barrier to access, right? Um, whether it's defensive or not, it's a barrier to access. Visa via is defensive. Um, and over here as well, what they did in the excavations, um, and there's a why and where for all. Why do archaeologists only excavate part of a site when there's, when there's a lot more there? The reason is due to technology. Um, there's other buildings over in the um, west. Um, there might be other buildings here. There's certainly other buildings, even, even in the excavated area, that they don't have much remains of. Um, and the reason why we don't excavate it is that there might be new technology. Um, it's good to be able to uh, keep a bit of the archaeology intact. So other people can go along and say, actually, you know, the archaeologists who dated that wall to um, 1280, it, uh, new technology tells us that it dates to 1250. So by survive, by have a little bit of uncontaminated archaeology left unexcavated, helps future generations understand what's going on. So on Monday when we do when I do the live lecture, so not to upset um, Goff, but the live lecture on Monday is done with one of my is done with one of my um, students from Ronda, and it's just the two of us, and we go over the lecture um because we are still in isolation we don't meet with the whole class we just meet with the one and usually we find problems and one of the problems that we found on monday uh was trying to work out from the photographs where that is on the plan on the on the on the um on the right there and i thought right I, i'm not going to be able to i'm not going to be able to do this lecture with the two alongside each other but glad to i'll show you eyes <laughs> get used to you then work out, you then work out, for example, that that there, that there on the left is that there on the right. And that building chamber on the left is that building chamber on the right. And then the big building, the Neweth Hall, is all this here. Um, and then you get this. So it made it, it made it easy for me to understand, um, doing it side by side. That is actually a passageway a later passageway. Um, so you've got several different phases with this site. Phase, phase zero, which could be anything. Phase one, which are this building, this building, this building. Phase two, widening the buildings. And phase three, putting little corridors in amongst these different things, linking all the little rooms together. You know, you, you see those, um, uh, you, you see all those sort of like, like, like close-knit castles where you get those little corridors with big fat Henry VIII wandering down the corridors. This is the type of thing that we're talking about, but a bit before his time. Um, so interpreting archaeology is always very, very difficult. And um, when I was excavating Hollybush Farm outside Cowbridge, um, we had a site artist on board. Um, and when we were excavating it, I couldn't see the walls. But when he drew it, you could actually see the walls. And when you're down on the ground, you can't really work out what's going on in the archaeology. You've got to have a site plan. You've got to have an overview plan. And then you're able to work out the site. I don't know if you were involved with Dr. Green at Kaya Went, um, Jim, but where you would have had to take photographs mm -hmm. of the... Were you there with him? Yes, I uh, was with Richard Brewer. At the time. All oh, right. Okay. I think so, it was a bit later, was it? Uh, Doctor Green, you're talking about 1991 and two at Kaya Went. Oh yeah, must have been there then. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would have been. And to be honest with you, Kaya Went, if you can remember, Jim, it was all these different bits of walls everywhere. Probably really difficult to work out. But when you photograph them from above, it's easy to get a ground plan. But you know, even as an archaeologist with my years of experience, it. it Looking at that and that, it actually took me a little bit of a while to work out what was going on. Because when, when you find photographs on the internet and stuff, and you're trying to research this type of thing, it's difficult to key everything together. So um, to, ha to try and date those walls that you're actually finding on the site, you need to find pottery like this. Uh, this type of pottery is, is probably around the late 1200s, 1300s. 
So if you find this type of pottery on the site, it's dating the site to closing down at that time because we know the site had been abandoned by about um, 1283, 1284. There were still people living within the landscape. And lo and behold, they all moved to Newborough, uh, which is the place a mile away from here. Um, and there's one thing that I will say, just those, those into their medieval and, and so on. If you ever go to Denevor Castle, um, the big house there is known as Newborough House, because what happened is after the, um, uh, after the Normans had taken over the area of, 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 of Denevor, um, after, after they'd taken it over, um, they they decided to um, they, they 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 decided that the Normans were going to build a new town, a new borough, and that's where the house is today. So if any of you get down there, this is what new borough means. New borough is a Norman name given for newly established townships for settlers or the Welsh people who've been displaced off their land. Um, and I know Rosamond was going on about this earlier on. Yes, this is a collection of. Um, of pottery that's actually um, from different parts of the country. And to be honest with you, it was rather interesting. When I, um, uh, when I uh, was gonna get married in August um, 1997, um, me, and my, me and my 2B and then wife, um, is, um, we went to Warwick Castle and, and people were actually reconstructing these and actually um, selling them. You can actually buy these as reconstructions. Um, and um, and they they are very much like the real thing. I actually had a girlfriend once who actually made one of these on the left. It looked like a really nice uh, dot on your jug as well. Um, so um, and just things like this. This is sort of typical. Um, this is more into the 1300s. This is a, the, the spout um, jug um, that was. They found two. They found two of these sort of spouts across Mester Medieval Village. But this is a type of pottery again that you're going to be finding at least Rossa to give some ideas of dating for the archaeology. The one thing you're not going to find is organic evidence like this. Um, you know, um, people basket weaving. You know, storage containers, clothing. Um, you know, you're not going to find anything like this because it doesn't organically survive. But if you're lucky enough to be excavating a bog body, what are you going to find? You might find artifacts like this, depending on what the acid like in the ground. Um, and we do know that um, the, the, at this site, they, they found um, you know, various nice bits of pottery that have been imported, given the idea of status to the site. So it's not just a normal common farmstead with a ditch around it and really ornate buildings. Um, so there's actually a lot going on there. Um, and here we go. Coin evidence. Um, this is this is a coin from um, from one of the Henrys. Uh, this is a coin from Henry the Third, um, who reigned at the same time um, as Llewellyn ap um, ap Yorath. And we had this big debate last night, which we're not going to do again. But the thing is about coin circulation. Just because we don't have coins with the head of Llewellyn ap Yorath on them, doesn't mean to say that they weren't produced. Lots of coins in circulation would have been uh, pennies from England, but guess what? Lots of coins in circulation would have been pennies from Scotland. Lots of coins in circulation would have been pennies from um, Ireland and um, France and so on and so on. So in other words, if you had a penny and you were able to weigh it, um, and it had a money a stamp on the back. You know, everybody, everybody used that money. It was, it was money in circulation. Usually what they do say is that Wales didn't have a money economy. Absolute poppycock. Um, but again, that's another talk. Um, in its final stages, as we, as we look at this, um, we, I've mentioned that um, um, they're extending the buildings um, they're, they're putting this, the, these into more of a court-like landscape, into a palace. That's what a palace is. The definition of a palace is all rooms interconnected rather than a court where buildings are around the central area. This is, this is the point. This is the um, um, thing I'm, I'm, I'm saying. And it had drainage as well. Um, this is for drainage. Uh, on, the, on the plan, you've got different dra drains. So there was actually drainage associated with this site as well. Um, and obviously looking at the plan, we can see that the change is in progress. Originally, it was laid out as a series of disconnected rooms 
Um, and in the foreground, you can see the chamber um, with the main hall beyond it. But the individual rooms were linked up um, by about 12, um, 70 odd. And the curved passageway, as you, we've, we've mentioned that, um, is, is the height of sophistication uh, leading to smaller rooms. And that's been unexcavated. Um, so sophistication is, when we use the word, a corridor to you guys might not seem sophisticated. But let me tell you this, up until a long time in the medieval period, they didn't have fireplaces um, in the walls. They had fireplaces in the center of the room. And when you're actually moving a fireplace from the center of the room into the wall, for example, to have proper flues and all the rest of it, that's sophistication. Now, what we do know is at this stage, the fireplace was still in the center of the room, but that's what that thing is there. It's the base for a fireplace. Um, and the development of this having a fireplace in the wall never came to pass. Um, and what simply happened with this landscape is they, they said, um, Edward I said to the, the people of the landscape, he said, right, um, you've got no choice. You've got to move to um, Newborough. If you, if you stay within this landscape, I'm going to tax you more. So if you come to Newborough, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna tax you as much as if you stayed on this landscape. So people just moved over there. Uh, this is what happened. And you know, anyone who wanted to be a lord on this land, you know, they couldn't, you know, under the rule of Edward I, if, he, if anyone could still be a lord on this land, they wouldn't have been able to raise their own taxes. So they wouldn't have been able to keep things going. So I know you've, some of you have seen this at, um, at St. Fagnes. Have you seen this, um, um, Jane? I haven't seen, yes, I have actually, yes. Yeah, I have. Now, do you want me to get into a rant, Jim? Yeah, go on. <laughs> I, I'm gonna get into a real rant. Do you know when I saw this at, um, do you know when I saw this at, um, at St. Fagans? I, I, I believed everything that the media said about it. The media says it's not a good representation of what um, Clewellyn's Hall looked like. Um, it's not based on accurate archaeological evidence, but what have I been reading? I've been reading the media. I've been reading what some other archaeologists have written. But when you look at the ground plan of the archaeology, that matches up directly with the ground plan of this building. Central doorway, the walls are thick enough to support those walls. They would have had narrow slots for windows, so I can't fault that. It's got a typical nice narrow Welsh doorway. And look at that chamber building on the, on the left there. Um, that chamber building on the left there is the chamber building on the left of the hall here. So this obviously does, it isn't related to Llewellyn the last Sleece. This is relating to Llewellyn the great Sleece who died in 1240. So this is what we're looking at. And uh, to be honest with you, I think that's a pretty good reconstruction. And I don't think anyone else can say any more than that because we don't have anything more. Um, what, what would be your thoughts on what I've just said that, with that, Jim? Yeah, would they just still have just single story buildings or would they could have like two or three story buildings? Um, now, this is an interesting thing. Having story buildings is also another innovation. Now, I would presume, Jim, that because the walls are over a meter in thickness, they're supporting more than just the Watland Daub framework above. They found a lot of stone across the site. Lots of stone would have been robbed and looted. But I'm thinking that um, even if there's not an, an, a loft or an attic in there, there may have been what could have been, if any of you have seen the whole building reconstructed at Cosmeston, which by the way is not very accurate at all. But if you've seen the whole building, Cosmos the Medieval Village, you see what, what they call a loft in there? Like a bio-like structure that you've got the ground floor and you've got some beams coming out and half of it is, is a first floor. That's what we're probably talking about. Um, but the answer is, Jim, I, I'm going with that being a good bet. I very much am. Um, and it's also likely that we would have been thatched rather than tiled. Now, that's probably due to the displacement value on the stone uh, below. When, when, and the way of working out, I don't know if any of you have, uh, remember the lecture that I did on St. Uh, uh, Peter's Church at Cogan Hall about cracks. 
Um, when you see um, um, cracks in stones on lower levels, uh, like they've um, like they fractured, it means that there's been stones placed on top, a lot of stones, and it's having a displacement value on the stones below. It's cracking them. It's it's, it's pulverizing them. Um, and the re to work out the height of a building and how long the height of the building stood is to examine those cracks. And I'm not exactly sure anybody's done that that done that with the fleece. And that would give you a real answer to the height of the building. Bingo. Now that there. Why do they think that it's not accurate, Carl? Why do they think? Why, why did? Yeah, why did the media and the um, historians think that it wasn't an uh, an accurate building? Um, to be honest with you, I, I could I could answer that it could be, you know, a political motive. Um, I could argue that um, I don't. To be honest with you, I think the answer is bog standard. I don't think the people writing those articles truly understood what the archaeology was about. I think okay. that's I think that's the answer. I do I do now, but I didn't when I saw the reconstruction. So I was biased myself. I, I the first thing I said to Michelle was, "Oh, what a load of nonsense!" and walked off. Um, so th this is this is um, but I do believe they've got it right. This is actually the head of Flewellyn Ap Yorath. Um, so we've got a carved bust of Flewellyn Ap Yorath. It's, it's carved out of sandstone, very ornate sandstone. And it also as well, because of the level of detail here, it was probably only displayed for a very short period of time before somebody said, oh, look at that. It's going to be destroyed by Edward the First Man, right? Let's get rid of it. Let's bury it. Let's take it home or something like that. You know, um, so it's in a really good state of preservation. Um, now, this itself would be nicely at home um, if we can if we can go back. Those that little head would be nicely at home at the start of the Springer for the arch on the left and the arch on the right. That's where you would have had those two little heads. That's where they usually put them. Um, as you enter the building, you'd look at this sort of little gargoyle-like face. It's not a gargoyle-like face, but, but you know my interpretation. That would have been part of the window or door um, fenestration, the, the, the stonework there. So um, to give you an idea of the scale, folks, um, I need to get my, my plan back the right way around because I'm going to confuse myself. To give you an idea of scale, right, that person is excavating. Um, and they are, look, look at that person in comparison with, with the building. And there's that corridor there. You can go down that corridor. It, on, the, on the plan, the corridor looks really narrow. But you could get two or three people abreast down that corridor. So it was, it was fairly wide enough. This is what they were developing, this core landscape into a palace. And what you can see there in the archaeology um, is that that's, that's that looks like it's organic um, burnt uh, material. So whatever's going on there, it's likely that that's probably from the earlier phase when uh, the, the wall was, the hall was a bit narrower. But this is actually a nice floor level. Um, and it's likely that maybe a little bit further on um, that this floor level supported the hearth of the fire. And in fact, the coloration there on the left would indicate some discoloration associated with that being the hearth. You'd have had two long tables either, either side of the hearth in the center of the room. Um, and again, um, if, if, we want to, if we want to point this north, we, uh, the, the, um, the, the image is a bit obtruse in the sense that it's a bit of an angle. So the whole looks um, square rather than sort of dumpily uh, rectangular. Um, so this is a site you actually see today. But as I said to you, this palace goes from the cursor probably all the way back to that bank there. So there's a lot more for archaeologists to find. And to be honest with you, right, um, excavating on a site like this would be an absolute dream because um, you're connected with something that I was told never existed. And, and when you touch archaeology, it does exist. It's actually real. Um, just to mention about the church as well, the very large church would indicate um, that this was the church associated directly um, with, with the princes of North Wales. Um, so again, um, if, we, if we want to look again at the large scale of this site, um, so we've got this, this person uh, here, 
Um, and they are there. Um, and this is all organic uh, residue. And do you know what? I, I have spotted, I've made a mistake with my interpretation. Um, sorry about this. Basically, when I said that this here was the hall, this here is in fact the chamber. So I've just, I'm sorry for that mistake. Um, so going back, that again, that gives you another size of the scale of these rooms. They're really big. They're, they're much, much bigger than I'm even interpreting. Even the chamber is a large room in comparison with this person. And the hall is much, much bigger. Um, and you, you've got, as you go from the chamber here, you go over to the hall, it's very large. You've got this drainage going all the way over here, which is this one here, going all the way over to the wall here. Um, and, you know, and then you've got this bit of grass here, the soil, and then you go over to the next building. Sorry about that mistake I made. Um, as you're looking in sort of profile across the site, you've got the chamber here. Uh, you've got the hall. And again, this is before they've lovingly um, restored the site so that you can actually visit it back to this plan. As I say, um, last time I went there, it looked a bit overgrown, but it's probably been maintained better since. Um, so what I'm going to do, we're going to read a little bit more, of, more about this lease to you. Um, and so um, just sort of paraphrase this, 1992 it was found, excavated in 1994, 1996, according to the Archaeological Trust. Um, Rossi is well documented as the Maya Dreif um, of the Kamot of Menai. Basically, Maya Dreif could mean um, the field of the town, a drive treff or something. A charter of Llewellyn ap Yorif was issued um, there in 1237, and the fair and market were well established before the conquest. So what we're talking about, um, you know, there's a lot going on there. You know, there is, there's more than just, um, it's, it's more than just a, a palace site. The pre-conquest de Mesny, which is sort of the, the area of the Lord, uh, a, a extended to about 600 acres. Um, in 1232, over 200 acres of land were lost as the result of a sandstorm and blown sand must have been a persistent problem. So in other words, uh, the site was lost. However, in the 1700s, a certain Henry Rowlands referred to the sand-covered rectangular ruined walls of the former Thlice, um, south of St. Peter's Church, Newborough. On the crest of a low, um, on a crest of a low relief, I think, locally a prominent ridge between the estuaries um, of the Brant and Kevney. Um, by the uh, by, the 1100s, nothing was visible. So, in other words, between between the um, 1700s, between the 1700s and when the site was refound in 1992, this palace of the Welsh princes completely disappeared. Um, so then it became known as Caerlys, together with the generalised um, locational information provided by the antiquarian um, um, sort of sources, led the archaeologists. Um, from the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust to excavate the site in 1994 after its positive identification in 1992. And the positive identification was by finding some of the pottery that you've already seen in this lecture. Uh, I'm going to interject a second. My stepdaughter wants to um, say something quickly. Oh, that looks very similar. I'll show everybody. Yes, that looks very good. Doesn't that look good, Jim? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That looks very good. So, um, and going back to this lease, by the 11 and 1200s, the administration of the Kingdom of Gwynedd was based on a network um, of, of local um, parishes serving a, a royal court. And we've mentioned all that. Um, and with about bond townships, about all the sort of money, there was a taxation system, probably going all the way back to the likes of um, Halvar. Um, and it's going here about, um, it's going here about um, some of the other information associated with the, with, with the duties of people and the king. These duties are documented and we know, for example, that at Rossier, Chlis Rossier, they included making the fence around the Chlis building works on the chapel um, and the hall and the Lord's privy and stable. 
um, and the tenants of the area were responsible for the upkeep of the royal palace. So that was basically their way of taxation. So everyone was involved in, in the everyday events of the landscape. The Welsh law book describes um, a jurist view of these buildings um, the king's tenants were expected to provide. So here we go, the king's tenants were to provide, the Welsh kings, they, in other words, the people um, were to um, offer themselves in the upkeep um, of the king's person, the king's landscape, the king's lease, um, and to sort of make sure that the, um, for example, the, the um, kilns are kept in good order, um, there's whitewash on the hall, even the uh, tea bath emptied um, as a, a form of taxation for the local people. It was the halls of the Lissoid, um, such as um, Rossia, that Gwynedd um, was governed. When the king was in attendance at the Llis, um, he, he, um, he summoned his councillors and other important men from the landscape. Business would be done in the hall during the day. Llewellyn Valor, Llewellyn Ap Griffiths signed the charter at Rossier in 1237, three years before his death. Um, in the evening, feasting and entertainment would take place around the Great Hall. It's the building on the right there, um, where there would be a, um, a great hearth um, in the Great Hall, kilns and ovens. Um, have been identified associated with this. The preparation of food laid out on great platters and elaborate display may have taken place in the room at the east end of the hall, provided with its own hearth. So we've got sort of an idea of what was going on from earlier documents and so on. So interestingly enough, we've got um, a reconstruction of, um, of the fleece, um, the, the palace, and this is an earlier reconstruction. Um, and what you can see is the other buildings. So we've got this building over there on the right. We've got a chamber on the bottom here. We've got the great hall. And then over there, we've got another large hall indicated of the walls and other structures. So there's a hell of a lot more for archeologists to excavate. And again, interesting enough, this is that ditch that um, Jim, Jim asked earlier on. There is an evidence of a ditch going around the outside. Um, a bit of a stone um, uh, bridge with a bit of an arch going underneath, um, if it ever contained water and whatever. It's just the, a ditch itself is to provide um, um, a, a zone, a barrier between one zone and another, um, not necessarily just for defence. And what you're talking here is sort of um, ideas of more sort of kiln houses. Um, it's, it's not actually showing <coughs> any of the drainage, but you know, the type of thing, this is a type of re reconstruction that you'd see associated with the Great Palace um, like this. And the other thing that could be said is that we are missing um, the locations for the palaces of the princes of Morganog and the locations of the palaces of the princes of Gwynedd. Um, and if you want me to go on, there's so many grey areas that we don't really understand. This was found not by accident, but by accident in the sense that David Longley of the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust had the power and the money to excavate it back then. That wouldn't happen today. Um, I just want to take us inside the room. Um, not long to go now. So we've got the table there, the great fire, and we sort of got the wonderful architecture in there. And these things here shown on the plan here are butts for large timbers that would have, um, that, that would have um, acted um, to support the, um, the structure of the roof, um, the spaniels and, and so on for the roof. So the, these butts here are to support timbers. Um, if we want to go on a little bit further, again, that's them building uh, this at St. Fagans. Uh, I'm not really sure of the stone. The, the stone there, look, to me, looks like local uh, Lias limestone, but obviously when it's whitewashed and rendered over, you're not going to know where the stone comes from. <coughs> um, and actually, I do believe that that is the end of the lecture. Um, but, before we, um, but before we ask for questions, um, can anyone guess where this is? Any ideas? Jim? Um, no. Jane? Is it North Wales? Yes, it is. Northeast Wales. Northeast. Nope. It's a very unusual castle. I'll tell you where this, this, this is Flint Castle. Um, and it's a very strange castle indeed because um, 
It's not built like a Norman castle. It's not built like a Welsh castle either. It's almost as if they built this stone castle in the middle of nowhere and they thought, oh, um, hang on a minute. We've got to build a stone bailey. And somebody said, don't connect it with the castle. Have it separate. So very strange castle this is at Flint. So um, what we're going to do, we're going to um, um, stop that and we're going to bring, uh, we're going to unmute uh, you all. Uh, are there any questions? Is there a, a, a settlement associated with the palace that we know of? Yes, but di directly south of the church is, is um, the, the church that you've seen over on the right. Uh, that's going to be the, um, that's the church associated with the police and it's probably probably the church associated uh, with the, the the small little township um, um, of Aberfrau and obviously the people then got displaced and, and moved a mile away to Eubra. And has that been excavated as well? No. Hmm. no. There's, so, there's so much in Welsh archaeology that hasn't been excavated. I think, I think the thing would be, an interesting point is, back in 1984, when I start, 1983, when I started excavating Cosmeston Medieval Village, um, it was one of the only medieval villages to be, ever be excavated in the whole of Britain. Um, now lots of medieval villages have been excavated in Britain, but lots of native villages haven't been. Except that we do know that Cosmeston did start off as a native village because um, uh, there was some evidence of an earlier pre-Norman village at Cosmeston, which they do still tell you about, I hope, when you go there. Any other questions, folks? No. No, I don't. Have you all, have you all enjoyed that today? Yes. Don't yes. Seem, yes. Don't yes. Seem, yes. 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 I can't, don't good. seem too enthusiastic. I'll just... I'll just put yeah. my head in the I thought Jim was going to ask a question. Yeah, Jim yeah. Jim. All right, all right yeah. then. First things first. Have you all enjoyed that today? Yeah. Rubbish. Yes, yeah. yeah, thank you. Jim, I your, so Jim, your question. Let's have your question, Jim. Any place name with the name Cleese in it would it indicate that there was a palace or a, a building of some sort there, like that? So yeah, or, or associated with? Um, I know what you're going to say yeah, now, probably. Cleese Wernie. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's believed it's believed that there's an earlier a palace associated with Clisworney. Yes, you're correct, uh, but it could be a, a very rich lord lord of the landscape. To be honest with you, we don't really understand we don't really understand enough to um, completely answer that conjecture. But Clis, Clisworney, yes, that's a good example. Uh, what were you going to ask, Andrea? No, no, I just said I missed most of the lecture because the hospital rang, but I'll catch up on it later. This will be online. For those that don't know, these lectures are online. Um, if anyone wants to stay behind and have a chat afterwards, and obviously I need um, um, to have a chat with somebody who wants to do a, um, a Zoom lecture with me about the, the archaeology of the erotica of Egypt. Um, I, know, I know Gillian's so keen to do that with me. Um, but if there's no more questions, um, I will leave this on for anyone who wants to talk to me. I'll see you all soon next week or, you know, Saturday, Wednesday or whatever. Uh, look forward to it. Um, you've been a great crowd today. Thanks for bearing with me. And I will see you all soon. Thank you very much. Uh, see you, okay. Keith, Jim, Bye. Sue, Jane. Thank you, Chris. Bye. 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 Thank you. My pleasure. Keep well. Bye. And you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Oh, that bye. Was, bye. Oh, bye. that was definitely Karen. Um, so that, uh, who's left? Oh, just Rosamond. Oh, Rosamond's going as well. Oh, she's staying there. Is, is Rosamond the one wanting to stay behind to talk about wanting to do a lecture, um, a lecture with me um, in the near future about the archaeology of the erotica of Egypt? Or is that going to be you, Jim? Oh, I think you wanted to say something about Pavlan Cave you mentioned. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, uh, ba ba basically, um, I, I, I know Goff's point, but at the end of the day, um, work-wise, um, you know, th this is for people, uh, other people, and um, uh, Andrea's already putting herself at risk to um, get these tablets and stuff to people, so we've all got to keep things going. So, um, so I'm thinking about Pavlan, probably... Um, Obviously, we won't be able to go down there for probably about a month, but uh, that is definitely, if you still want to do that, we'll go down.
Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Just let me know when. Okay, okay. Okay, I, I, and I are you in Barry this I, I, I will be in Barry. I, I am. I'm going to look at my diary when I'm in Barry next. Um, I will be in Barry. Um, no, actually, 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 actually. Do you know what I think I'm going to do? I will be in Barry on Friday. I think. Oh. Wow. So what? What I'll do, Jim? I'll, I... I'll give you a ring. What's that? I'd say I could um, uh, let you have that picture. I could oh. drop that picture off to you. Yeah, no, that that that'd be fine. And you said you wanted some eggs, did you? Um, well, in exchange, yeah, I thought it was a fair exchange. <laughs> no robbery, <laughs> cheeky bastard. <laughs> but no, I, I, to to be honest with you, I'll see if we got any um, eggs. Eggs. I'm not. I'm not being tight, but just in case we 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 don't have enough. So uh, yeah. Oh, don't you, worry. To, to be honest, to be honest with you. To be honest with you, looking at the egg situation, we might have to leave this till Sunday. So I got enough eggs to make the trip to Barry worthwhile. I, I tell you what, it's going to have to be Sunday because that's what. So I'll have enough eggs. So it's going to be Sunday, Jim. Well, the thing is, I'm coming to Barry to do some various things on Friday, so I can still drop it off to you the picture if you're if you're there. Um, I won't be there, but um, if you wanted to drop it off, my um, my my parents will be in at One Cannon Street at the bottom of the hill. Oh, right. Um, well, I can see you Sunday. Pop and see you Sunday. No depend on, well, we could do that. I'll put you down in the book and uh, Jim. Brilliant. Okay, Duke. Lovely. So say goodbye now. Take okay. care, darling. Bye, Jim. Bye bye, Jim. Bye. Woo! bye. <laughs> oh, right. So do I turn the mic off on this bit? I probably do. Are you, are you off? Rosamond, did you want to chat about something? Or are you off? You've muted, muted yourself. Uh, mute, oh. mute myself. Uh, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, it was the forum, really. Carl, I was thinking of that, that sounded interesting. I'm not sure about doing the erotica of Egypt. I, I will if you step for someone to do it with you. No, so it, it has to be looking at sort of... Um, male and female forms naked and do it really professional well you know that that's sort of a really nice figure and sort of you know those breasts are really tender and that that phallus is really big and huge and that and sort of do it in a really nice sort of manner <laughs> Bar barbara would be up for I, that. You know, barbara yeah I, I might get if you haven't got anyone else i'll give it a go <laughs> i i, I, I thought the forum was a good idea right so i think probably You're the breaking up hun well, I think the forum would work, right? The and then um, books. What's that? Okay. Go well, for so it. Last week you mentioned books. I've got lots of books. Right. Um, okay. I haven't sorted them all out yet, but Andrea mentioned books. So yes, yeah, so, that's well, the three things then covered, isn't it? So, so you've got the Andrea books. They're very interesting. Oh, don't, don't worry about the... I've got the, books. I need to go through them. I don't know what... Okay, don't worry about the erotica lecture, but the thing is about the forum, yes, we can, we'll put that on the staff thing and we'll discuss it, okay? I thought that was a good idea. Um, yeah. Yeah, great Let's, lecture, exhausting, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Long I am, again to sort of research and look into. I am actually a bit exhausted now, so, all right then, so keep it up to date and we will, um, uh, do you know the grant thing the other day? I think um, the problem was, because because I was being hit yes. by this this other grant, what I've done, I I I I've made the suggestion to it, right? When when they if they say okay. that if that's good or not, what I'll do, then the application form needs to fill be filled in. So that's okay. that's that's the way we'll do it. Great. All, all right, right then. Thanks okay. very much, Carl. Okay. Very interesting lecture, and thanks for all your time. My my I'm pleasure. Trying to leave now. <laughs> Love to Tommy, and uh, did, did Stavlet enjoy Wednesday? I haven't spoken to him yet. Hopefully I'll speak to him later or tomorrow, and uh, then, then I'll have a chat. But, but Matt, Tom was interested, because of course he's been to Pompeii. So, oh, um, right. And he's also interested to hear all about these castles and things I've learned about. So it's uh, definitely giving me stuff to, to keep me occupied. <laughs> and, and something to talk to Tom about, exactly.
and something to talk to my hus- dear husband about, yes. Your, your wonderful husband. Yes, so he's home till next Wednesday, so uh, I've got him for a few more days yet. Remember, if he, if he says he's got to go south, point him uh, northwards, okay? <laughs> north, north, northeast or something, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah, look forward to going out on these walkabouts with you too. Yeah, no, we'll get... We're, and we're hopefully, go- you know, we won't cause too much controversy on the group. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't I, actually, I don't really believe that, I don't really think Goff really understands what we're doing, so. No, because it, uh, where we're going actually is within my, my distance anyway. Yes, yes, and, yes. Um, we're allowed out for an hour a day at the moment. So yeah, but if, we, if we're doing things, like if we're doing things for, uh, for the community anyway, so it's just like, yeah. So, uh, yeah. All, all, all right, yeah, go on. Okay. Thanks then, Carl. I'm going to try and leave now. All right then. Take care. Soon. See you soon. Bye. Love to Michelle. I will. Love to Michelle. I will. Bye. Bye bye. End of meeting. Da, 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 da.